So welcome to our seminar on how to teach transition and how to work with eyewitnesses. My name is Nora Korte. I'm the coordinator of the project. We and I warmly welcome you, welcome you to our first uh, lesson, our first seminar on how to work with eyewitnesses, how to teach transition. We have gathered uh, now to uh, learn from our experts uh, uh, how to methodologically access this topic. We have invited uh, three experts uh, who will share uh, their very like, crucial experiences. First of them is Alicia Pashevich, our dear colleague. She is an economist and um, a uh, civic and uh, educational activist. She has founded several organizations and among them a school. And she's also an expert for civic education in Poland. We're also happy to welcome Momchil Metodiev from Bulgaria. We have been working together on transition uh, for quite a while. He is a professor on his of history uh, at the new bulgarian university in sofia and he is also editor of uh, many different scientific works and articles and also joining us is as, ex, as an expert is barbara christoph uh, uh, culture scientist and a, a sociologist from the uh, university uh, in Germany next week, we will meet in a more intimate like kind of atmosphere. It will be a Zoom meeting where all of us, where we will be able to see each other. I'm very much looking forward to get to know you, to talk to all of you. I'm happy to, to see that uh, we have so many participants already. This is the first day of our workshop and today it is open to everybody who is interested and but next week we will uh, work with all uh, with those of you who uh, are willing to really work to really participate in our transitional dialogue project and to work with eyewitnesses we have like most of our guests or our expert guests understand russian but russian is not their mother tongue so they will speak in english they will talk to you in english so if you would like to listen in russian please find the icon of uh, of the globe and find the language uh, and choose the language uh, in which you would like to listen. Now I would uh, give the microphone to Alicia, please. Yes, she switched on her video. If you need any, any help, we are here with that. Hello, hello everyone. I'm very glad to be here among you. I do understand Russian, but I'm not uh, um, very fluent. Uh, I'm not a fluent speaker. So unfortunately, I will switch to English uh, now. Oh, oh, soon, I mean, my name is Al Alicia Alicia Patsevich. I am okay. English. My name is Alicia Patsevic. <laughs> so sorry uh, to the interpreters. Uh, my name is Alicia Patsevic, and I I am um, sixty plus, which is important because uh, uh, transition is also part of uh, my personal uh, biography, and uh, which is uh, an asset. 
but at the same time um, in talking about transition and in teaching about transition it may result in a sort of a, you know choosing the um, even unconsciously the um, personal perspective on transition so the first thing that um, I, um, is a challenge for teaching transition is to really find a proper uh, perspective and also in the perspective which is multi-perspective which includes different perspectives on what has happened and what uh, are the present results of it. I would like to share my very, 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 very short presentation with you. Um, um, важность преподавания переходного периода. It's called the importance of teaching transition. I, I, have, I will start with some photos, with three photos. I could, of course, add many more, but uh, just as a sort of a reminder of the times that we are talking about and trying to understand and uh, teach about. So this is the photo from the uh, 80, uh, August of 80, uh, the moment when solidarity movement in Poland was born. And this is the, um, uh, the shipyard during the strike which was um, declared as a gesture of solidarity towards other um, factories and places of work, which uh, were at the, sa at the same time uh, protesting against, oh, against many things. Because as you probably know, solidarity movement was not only about um, social and economic rights it's it was also about uh, independence about polish identity and many other things so as you see this was you you can even feel the vibe and uh, may, maybe some of you will notice that uh, the portraits on the um on uh, here you would see John Paul II and some other, um, you know, Catholic iconic images. Because at that time, it was a sort of a, a it was a national movement. It was a workers' movement, uh, but it was also supported by the, the church, Catholic Church, at that time, who definitely played a big and positive role in Polish transition, especially at the beginning of it. Now it's worse, but we will come back to it maybe. Um, the oh, sorry. The second, uh, the second um, photo is uh, also iconic. You probably all recognize uh, the place. Uh, and the, it also gives us the feeling that uh, this was a big moment of history, definitely. Uh, and the third photo, uh, which is from Belarus, from last year um, demonstrations, um, is uh, also a, a very good, gives us an insight into the fact that this is not just a historical event, that this is people <laughs> and their uh, decisions to take part in a movement, in a strike, in a demonstration, which is usually uh, doesn't have a certain um, a clear uh, uh, effect and very often is dangerous. Uh, and uh, this is a sort of a short, um, uh, somehow I wanted to take you into the, the times and into the places of, um, uh, the, sorry, not this one, the next one, uh, of the uh, changes that were taking place. I have lost my, oh, here. Um, to talk about, 
um, challenges and opportunities of teaching transition. Because um, if you, even if, uh, you know, we could add here a photo from Georgia, uh, we could add here a photo from Ukraine, we could add here a photo from Russia, and uh, all those photos give us the very intense feeling that this is a, a, a photograph of a very, of a historic moment. So one reason why we should teach about transition is the fact that it was one of the most important historic events in the uh, 20th century. Uh, for example, if you ask Polish students uh, what were the most important events in the 20th century, they would, uh, most of them would name uh, three of them. One would be regaining independence at the beginning of the century, then the Second World War, and um, the fall of communism, which, and, and things which were happening at, uh, after. The, the, the message um, that I, I have in my mind uh, talk, uh, while talking to you is that you know, the moments, the, those glorious moments of big events on the streets, in the factories, or uh, um, uh, breaking the Berlin Wall, these are the, the breaking points. But what is really uh, crucial when, when we think about um, transition is not only this moment itself, but the things which were before and after. And uh, so um, teaching about transition is uh, not only showing those glorious um, moments, but mostly focusing on what led to them and also what happened next. And this is something that um, we have been uh, researching in the project Transition Dialogue, looking for uh, the good and bad practices of uh, teaching transition. And one thing which is um, somehow very common to most of the uh, seven post-communist countries taking part in this Transition Dialogue project maybe, maybe with the exception of Germany, is that uh, teaching transition is very often marginal. That it's not given enough time and uh, educational gravity. So uh, this is my, my first point when we come to challenges. Very often, transition because it's at the end of uh, the, the history course. It, uh, you know, teaching about it, it's usually end of May or June. And it really makes um, many students um, uh, deprived of real education about transition. Also, I don't know how it's in your countries, but in Poland at least, but also in, in many other places that I have uh, researched is that the teaching history is very often looks like a reversed pyramid. So that we spend a lot of time on uh, ancient times, on medieval times, but and ma maybe on the, on the you know, first and second world war. But when you, the, the closer to our times, the less gravity it, ha it has. Very often it's treated, you know, not as real history. It's something that is still happening. Uh, and this is also a problem for many teachers and for many, for many students. Um, um, when, when, when looking into the, into the teaching practice in, in the schools, uh, we can see that, uh, you know, because it's at the end, because uh, sometimes it's, uh, teachers are a bit afraid of uh, 
you know, going deeper because uh, teaching about transition is also teaching about political conflicts, which still have consequences today. And this is a big challenge in, uh, at least in, in, uh, in Poland, and I know that also in Lithuania, probably also in, in Bulgaria, that many teachers are, do not feel comfortable talking about uh, political um, processes and consequences of uh, transition because they have a very direct link to today conflicts. In Poland, for example, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at, into the public discourse on transition, there is no one public discourse. There are two completely separate public discourses. One is saying that uh, transition and you know, round table talks, which led to the peaceful agreement of, uh, with the communists and things that happened later, the economic reform, uh, the ruling party and the, the right wing parties, which are now in the government, uh, are, they have the narrative, very strong narrative, that it was the betrayal of the values and uh, um, goals of solidarity movement from the early 80s. And that it was done wrong, that it was a sort of a conspiracy. And um, at the same time, um, the, the, the other, uh, let's say, narrative bubble um, more to the center and to the left, let's say, they see themselves as, uh, um, you know, they see the, 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 that this is part of their tradition, that this is thanks to um, round table talks and transition, Poland is now uh, still an independent country uh, with uh, relatively big uh, uh, guarantees of freedoms and um, um, human rights. So the, this second narrative is uh, open, of course, to many criticism on roundtable talks and the way that economic uh, transformation was done in Poland. But in general, it's a sort of a positive, it's uh, seen as a posit a very positive social political process, which helped us also join NATO and uh, European Union. And it's really, these two narratives are completely incompatible, which creates a lot of tensions. Uh, also in the classroom, because uh, the society is polarized. Uh, parents have different views. Some of them vote for the uh, you know, right-wing parties. The other vote, would like to vote for the opposition parties. And the teacher is somehow um, doesn't feel comfortable uh, when, uh, when talking about uh, transition, because everything is controversial. And talking about controversies and having debates with stu students, whether, for example, Lech Wałęsa was uh, a, as a hero or a, a traitor. It's not something which is easy to uh, organize such a debate with, you know, uh, good historical um, uh, sources and arguments they don't do it. I mean, this is very often very superficial. And uh, I could go, you know, deeply into, into, into this, but I will, uh, I'm very curious. Unfortunately, I can't see you and I can't talk to you. But uh, while you listen to what I'm saying, I would, uh, I would invite you to think about the uh, narratives that are mostly present in main in the mainstream, let's say, um, teaching and public discourse in your countries. Is there one narrative? Are there 
many narratives? Are they in conflict? Or maybe, because you know, having many narratives is not bad. But if you have, uh, the, but they, they should be somehow in dialogue. If you have two completely separate conflicting narratives, it's very difficult for everyone to, 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 to cope with it. Um, the, the problem that we uh, all probably face and I call it lack of zooming out, is the fact that very often in, in the teaching, we think that our transformation was a very, very unique and special uh, uh, event. And that somehow it, uh, I don't know how it's in Georgia. It might be completely different. In also in Ukraine, but um, in Poland uh, and certainly in Lithuania, uh, I have noticed the tendency to look at the transformation, the transition as uh, uh, something, um, as a proof of how big our nation is. And uh, so, it's not, you don't see transition, Polish transition, for example, as part of a bigger uh, geopolitical, social, uh, emancipatory also um, wave, which happened in the, in the uh, 80s and 90s in this part of the world. But you, very often you think, you know, this is Poland who really, uh, was the cradle of all of this. We, uh, if not for us, the you know communism would be still there. We forget that this was a process which took part, which uh, took place in uh, all the countries around us, and that this is not a you know a proof of the greatness of uh, Polish nation. But this is rather a political and social process that would be great for students to understand. And there is a lot to, to understand. How, why? I mean, how it happened? How, how are transformations happening? When do they start? Who can start them? What is the role of a you know, one person like, I don't know, Lech Wałęsa, Anna Valentinovich, or any other persons who, you know, go, uh, who are the leaders. And can the leaders function without the civil society? And uh, is, is civil society something, uh, sort of a prerequisite to, uh, to transformation or can just one leader come and change, you know, the people into, uh, <laughs> transform them into a new society. There are many uh, interesting questions and uh, most of them are not even asked uh, in, the, in, 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 in the classrooms and, and other places. One thing, and I think Barbara is going to talk about this uh, more, is that um, there are that that you know teaching history very often is about facts and dates and you know big names and there is this deficit of zooming in the deficit of looking into the people concrete people concrete historical actors sometimes very uh, like every every man <laughs> fate not only the leaders, but normal people who took part in it. So I think that what we, uh, what's a big challenge is how to include the um, eyewitnesses stories. And this, you know, the, the, this, that's why I love this project so much that it's really zooming in. It's trying to look at the uh, lives uh, of real people uh, during um, transition, because this is how you can understand better uh, how history is, is really made. 
uh, lack of multi-perspectivity uh, is uh, also something that I will just uh, mention here because also uh, Barbara who will be talking later, she is a big specialist on this. But uh, what is clear is that um, in very often in the, the mainstream um, educational, uh, um, let's say practice is that we really um, have this, you know, one dominant perspective from which, uh, for example, the perspective of uh, the political uh, leaders, usually male, in, po in Polish case, these would be male figures, very often with mustache. And how about women? There were millions of women involved in solidarity movement and also uh, in the transition period and they were not only preparing food for the striking people How, though during the strike it was mostly men who were because mostly men were working in the in the shipyard but there was also anna valentinovich who was a woman and she was working there and all the women who were working in the shipyards were also there but if you look at the photos you would see mostly men. I have here this, oh, no, not this, here. This is a page from a textbook for uh, about uh, the lesson on transformation uh, from uh, for primary school. And this is one of the exercises. And your students are asked to name who, what the, the, the photo shows. Can you see? Any women here? I can see maybe one. I can see one, and maybe there would be if you if we had a you know a bigger uh, a bigger picture. Maybe on this uh, on this photo with the, with the demonstration of solidarity, we could see more women. And there were, <laughs> and this is uh, you know how also this narrative. This mainstream narrative is uh, creating, it's being created. So uh, that's why we are so much here for um, using uh, eyewitnesses and uh, zooming into people's lives, into people's decisions, into people's fear of going out into the street or going in the strike, and also into people's tr frustrations after let's say those glorious moments because um, tough reality tough economic reality is coming and for example those people who were um, active in uh, overthrowing communism a year later uh, got unemployed because they're you know the 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 state uh, factory was uh, sold to to the to, or or just closed. Um, uh, uh, and the three three more uh, short uh, challenges. Um, dealing with controversies, I was already talking about it. That uh, this is something that if you because you are also educators and you will be also dealing with this problem if you decide to have a lesson on uh, transition. Uh, in, in our case, and uh, this is very often the, the case in not only in Poland, that you, because you don't know how to deal with controversy, you are not, as, a, as an educator, you are not prepared to have a um, you know, a, a sort of a battle of argu arguments. You are afraid that some students will then, in Poland, for example, now, you, are, you may be also afraid that some students will report to their parents that, uh, you know, that um, the narrative during the lesson or that there were, there were students who were saying things which are not, uh, you know, that, that, that are different from the official ruling party uh, narrative. 
So very often it's just avoided. Sometimes it's mentioned, uh, controversies are mentioned. For example, the controversies on uh, economic transformation that you know and you can in the textbook you could the best practice you could get would be probably getting two texts on the economic reforms that were done in 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 poland or in i don't know croatia and one would be against uh, you know this way of of uh, changing um, economic system from central governance into into free market or market regulated uh, and the other would be for it and this is you know if you get it it means it's a very good textbook because it at least shows that there are different opinions on it and uh, teachers very often very much appreciate it because it also gives them the material uh, that can uh, help them in organizing a uh, classroom situation where uh, some of the arguments can be taken from the uh, text and the, the teachers don't have to invent them by themselves. So I think that, that um, one of the important thing is to really um, uh, have in mind that the general let's say image and evaluation of things that were happening during some transition is uh, can be very different and that the students should have the possibility to find out what the differences and what the 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 you know points that people disagree upon what they are and this is all this is here we go also to the to the problem of uh, of i know i know one minute um, here we we uh, we go to the general problem of teaching history uh, which is very often um, very often just uh, you know passing on certain knowledge and not uh, inviting students to um, construct the knowledge themselves uh, this is something that um, in 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 uh, in the uh, it, that's difficult and there are many also ideas on how to do it because constructing your own knowledge if you are a student in a limited uh, you know portion of time is something that many teachers uh, are afraid to use as a method because it takes more time you never know what students are going to come up with and very often you are also afraid that you know at the uh, final exam the students will not be asked to create knowledge they will be asked to report the you know historical <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the names, places, and numbers, and dates. So this is a risky endeavor, but this is something that, uh, especially in teaching about transition, is something that is uh, would be very highly uh, um, would be recommended. But it has to be done in a guided practice way. Um, we have also sometimes the examples of teachers who just drop students into the well of uh, history of transition without any help. And then you can really get very strange results. So um, I, I hope that during the next meetings with you, uh, and I know because I know the, the plan that uh, DRA came up with, I know that you will get some ideas on what methods can be a sort of lifesavers for students digging into deep into history of uh, transition. And this is uh, just, you know, my, my um, I'm, and I will also have uh, the meetings with you 
uh, and this is my last uh, this is my last sentence teaching transition is not only valid because it talks about the glorious uh, sometimes dangerous not always very positive but very crucial events and processes but also because it gives us a sort of an entry point into analyzing uh, bigger big ideas and big processes such as civil society such as human rights such as uh, uh, workers rights and social rights and even dignity so transition is a gateway to <laughs> finished Алиса, спасибо тебе, тебе огромное uh, за твои водные слова. Я знаю, что ты можешь... Алиса, thank you very much for your introduction. I know you can, you can tell us much, much more, and we will be listening to you next week, and the next couple of weeks, and so we will give our uh, participants the opportunity to uh, talk to Alicia. Alicia will stay with us for a while and yes, and the participants can uh, ask their questions to Alicia in Russian because she understands Russian very well. And now um, the stage is open to Mom Chil, who will open to us uh, his results of his studies and uh, especially of his um, results on on the like white spaces on what's missing in our uh, picture of transition I'd like to ask you to excuse me it's the same as in case of Alicia. I understand everything what's told in Russian, but my Russian is not fluent enough. It's not good enough to to freely uh, talk to you. Just when I'm talking in Russian, uh, we have talked before the session with Nora. It can sound it can sound really really funny. So I'm sorry, but if you have any questions, uh, of course I can. I can understand what you're uh, what you're talking, uh, what you're asking, and what you're talking about. Uh, so my uh, task for this session is to present the result of uh, mapping of the textbooks in the seven countries that we have done for uh, the same project that Alicia mentioned, uh, transition uh, transition dialogue, and uh, I must say. Uh, I must say that uh, when I have started my participation in this project, uh, this project was for me a kind of kind of an eye opener. Uh, when I'm saying eye opener, I mean that uh, Alicia mentioned uh, also that, uh, for example, in Poland there is a controversy over the person of Lech Walesa. Uh, but uh, uh, from Bulgarian point of view, Lech Wales is not a controversial person at all. He is, uh, he is really a hero, and he is always in our textbooks, he is presented as a hero. And I don't have a question that he was a real hero. Uh, but for example, in Bulgarian textbooks, we have the same problem with the leader of the Bulgarian anti-communist forces at that time, uh, Zhelu Zhelev. So, uh, it's the same problem in Bulgaria, but depending on the perspective, uh, the persons and uh, people are evaluated in uh, in a different way. Uh, so I'm not sure. Uh, can you see my presentation? It was uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, just a second. Uh, so why it was necessary to make this mapping and at least what is my, my understanding for the necessity of this mapping? Uh, the necessity or my answer to this question is that all of our countries have some problems right now. We have started from a common, common starting point and uh, we have common heritage, common history, 
maybe not common, but uh, it is uh, the problems that, that we had after the Second World War were relatively similar. Uh, then the communism collapsed, and then uh, not only the events divided, but also the narratives divided later on. So right now we have all our countries, uh, we have problems. Usually most of the countries have problems with so-called rule of law. In Bulgaria, at least, it is widely talked right now that uh, there is a how to say, political, uh, political message that the state is captured uh, so that uh, uh, democracy should be restored or uh, that the deficit with uh, the rule of law, especially, is uh, an important deficit that uh, should be uh, should be should be resolved this problem in a way. Uh, and of course, when people are looking for uh, explanation where those problems come from, uh, usually the answer is that uh, the problems are rooted in the transition. Uh, then we have several questions. First, of course, is what is transition? And I will, I'm not going to answer this question because transition is very uh, ambiguous term, but I will outline several of those problems. Uh, then I will go to uh, the moments and the reasons why the divisions, uh, why the narratives divided and how they divided. And uh, then uh, I will go, of course, to the main point, what is missing in the textbooks, or at least what is my perception, or, uh, of course, based on the mapping of those textbooks, uh, what is missing and why it is missing. And uh, finally, I will try to, 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 to share some, some thoughts, very brief thoughts, how this could be changed or why it should be changed. Uh, so talking about uh, talking about transition, of course, it's a mm, 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 it's a it's a problematic point because transition is a term which is completely neutral. It doesn't mean anything specifically. Transition uh, uh, being being a, being a neutral term, it does not imply neither positive. Uh, nor negative connotation. Transition could be to something good, but it's a, it could be to something bad. Uh, so that's why historians, uh, for example, they prefer and regularly they're using uh, the term post-communism, post especially about the period of transformation of the former communist countries into democratic or at least market-oriented uh, uh, market oriented economies. Uh, but, uh, of course, I'm, uh, since transition is uh, a popular term, it is used in the textbooks, uh, and that's why uh, all of us, uh, when we're talking about transition, we share a common idea, probably, that there was a change from something to something. Uh, that's why, of course, we are using the term transition, and I'm using the term transition uh, exactly in this in this end. Then we have several levels of understanding of transition. First level, of course, is theoretical. It is uh, rooted in uh, politology. Uh, can we see the next slide? Uh, yeah, maybe the next one, sorry. Uh, so uh, transition is, uh, 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 being a neutral term, it has several connotations. One of these connotations, of course, is theoretical connotation. Uh, uh, and in politology, there are several schools that are talking about, uh, about transition. Uh, there are schools of revolutionists. There are schools of the third wave of democ democratization. Uh, but actually, uh, this scientific or purely theoretical understanding of transition is not, uh, is not part of our understanding of transition. What I mean is that another level of understanding of transition is, as we can call it, practical level of transition, or practical level of understanding of transition. Uh, what I mean is that in the practical, in theoretical level, transition is something clear. It's transition from uh, communism to democracy, and it's transition from common economy to market uh, to market economy. Uh, uh, what about uh, practical practical understanding of transition? Uh, for example, in Bulgaria, several years ago, there was a debate 
uh, uh, there was a debate whether transition was over and when transition was over. And there were there were different different opinions. Of course, there were a lot of people that said transition uh, uh, transition ended when Bulgaria became part of European Union and so on. But uh, there were a lot of voices that disagreed. They said no, transition is not over uh, since uh, uh, still we have deficits in, in the field that are rooted in transition in transitional period, meaning especially in the uh, problems with the rule of law. Then transition is not over. Uh, so practical understanding of theoretical understanding of transition is on one level and practical understanding of transition is, uh, is, is, is different level of transition. And when we are talking of transition, usually uh, we, are, uh, we, are, we are talking exactly in this practical level. And that's how the term is popular and that's how it is widely used uh, uh, in, 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 in public speaking uh, in our countries. And quite often it is used in the same way in, uh, uh, in the textbook. Uh, of course, uh, another level of understanding of transition is that uh, it, it, is, uh, it is an event, the collapse of communism, and then uh, the changes after this. Uh, it is an event which was full of hope, meaning people expected that their better will become, uh, that their life will become uh, better, and that's normal, and that's how it should be. So, uh, on practical level, uh, uh, I mean, on theoretical level, transition is something clear. It's transition from communism to democracy, or from common economy to market economy. But on practical level, uh, 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 practical level, uh, on practical level, uh, it is ambiguous term. But it is also it also implies a lot of hope that the future will be better, and that uh, of course the life of the, pe the people would become better. At least, at least that were the expectations of transition. And uh, thirty years later, or twenty years later, uh, it it is obvious that uh, life is better for quite a lot of people. People could be richer, could be. Uh, yeah, richer, but it doesn't mean that they're happier, or it doesn't mean that they're feeling uh, better, meaning that uh, 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 when we are evaluating transition from the current point of view, uh, quite a lot of people uh, felt disappointed, or uh, it seems to them that it, it wasn't the same that they expected. Uh, so uh, 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 there is this, I, I think this, personal point of view is very important. And when Alicia was talking that talk, uh, teaching transition in the schools implies controversies, even controversies between uh, teachers and students or uh, controversies between teachers and parents. Uh, it's exactly on this point that, uh, mm, that those controversies are, uh, are, uh, are rooted. Uh, uh, so this is the this is a good basis, and I think this is the, the the core of the problem. This is a good basis for division of narratives. Uh, exactly this ambiguity of the of the meaning of the term transition is a good basis for uh, 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 for uh, uh, di division of narratives, dividing of narratives. Meaning there are several several narratives about about transition, and there are several. I can say at least three reasons for uh, for, for this division of, uh, of narratives. The first reason, of course, is what was the goal of the transition? Uh, whether it is whether it was uh, on whether whether it was mainly establishment of a liberal Western style democracy, or uh, the goal was restoration of the national dignity, for example, or of the national, yeah, national dignity. Uh, and this is very important problem because uh, 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 if, uh, if the goal of the transition in the early 90s usually was associated with uh, establishment of Western style of liberal, of liberal democracy, uh, quite often it became, it became visible and obvious later on that uh, or at least the goal, retrospectively, the goal of the transition is presented as restoration of the national, of the national dignity, of the, of the greatness of the nationhood, as Alicia mentioned it, uh, 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 it mentioned it before, before me. 
Uh, so this is the first reason for division of narratives. When we are looking on, into the textbooks, and usually textbooks are written from the same point of view, uh, state can present a uh, 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 transition as something successful if it was successful in restoring national dignity, regardless of the fact whether uh, whether uh, 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 the principles of the liberal state were uh, also uh, also established. Uh, so the second uh, the second reason for division of narratives is exactly uh, is exactly this. Uh, transition implies also a very big social change. Uh, it was mentioned the problem, for example, of privatization, uh, uh, but not only privatization, it's also, of course, the problem of, of, of the social status, uh, who, uh, who is the winner and who is the loser uh, from the transition. Uh, so it is possible that from the point of view of the state, transition is something successful, but at the same time, uh, 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 people don't think or they don't regard the period of transition as something, uh, as something successful. Uh, for example, uh, mm, uh, in Bulgaria, at least in our textbooks, is clearly written uh, that, uh, uh, or mm, without having a positive or negative uh, uh, mm, mm, esteem, uh, uh, it is clear that the transition is uh, uh, presented as something good. And uh, the reason for this is that Bulgaria became member of NATO and European Union. Uh, but the point of view of the regular people, and uh, not only of the people from the center of Sofia, for example, not always is uh, in the textbook, uh, it's lacking. So this is the second reason for division of narrative. Uh, and the third reason, uh, which to me is very important, is technological revolution. Meaning that in the same time that transition happened in our countries in the 90s, uh, happened this technological revolution, uh, rise of the internet, then social media, uh, and uh, the whole way of making of, uh, of, of, of the public opinion, how the public opinion is formed, uh, has changed completely. Uh, so uh, uh, voices that could be regarded as uh, marginal, uh, they, can be, they could become extremely noisy and they can try to change uh, the narrative due to, due to this new technological, uh, technological uh, revolution. Uh, so all those, uh, uh, those divided narratives, we are going to the point of what is missing or what is missing in the textbooks. Uh, of course, uh, all those things that I'm going to talk about, they're, uh, they're mentioned in the textbooks, but they are not uh, they are not explored, or they they are not uh, they are not uh, talked widely. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, so talking about blind blind spots in the textbooks or things that are not mentioned, uh, maybe the most important thing is uh, the exactly the point of social so social status, uh, meaning. Uh, because uh, transition implies a deep social change, and this social change is not only, but for example, again, I'm going, I'm giving an example from Bulgaria, but I think it's uh, quite the same in the whole Eastern Europe. Uh, 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 a person came uh, today. A person could be richer, but at the same time, he can feel that his social status is lower, or even worse, if a person is coming from a town that was depopulated, and there are a lot of such towns in Bulgaria right now. And uh, even if he's living richer or better than 30 years ago, but if his uh, uh, his children are not around him, his town is empty. Uh, those children are living somewhere abroad. They are doing a second class job or something like this. Of course, the the, the person that I'm talking about. He would felt certain uh, certain dis disappointment. Uh, uh, so uh, when I'm talking about uh, the question of social status and the problem that is uh, as a problem that is missing in the textbooks, it's exactly that's what that's what I'm meaning. And again, I'm going back to the problem that usually textbooks are written from the point of view of the state. So those are different perspectives that somehow should be presented in the textbooks because. Textbooks are addressing the problems of, of the students in their 
uh, and of course, uh, be, uh, the problems of the students, and they're supposed to answer the question of the students why there is, uh, why my grandparent, for example, uh, is not happy and uh, he's talking, something, talking to me something, uh, something completely different. Uh, for example, and, and of course, talking about social status, where uh, 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 we are faced with the question of how the new elites were constructed. Uh, uh, whether, and of course, then it comes the main question, whether transition was fair or not. Uh, so, uh, especially the question of the new elites, it's again, very problematic point because uh, 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 with the new elites, uh, at least in quite a lot of countries in our region, uh, we cannot say that the new elites were constructed in a uh, meritocratic or at least understandable for the wider public. Uh, 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 for the wider public, uh, so this is a problem that, uh, of course, it's very controversial. It's nuanced, so. Exactly because of this, quite often those problems are not uh, are not uh, are not mentioned. Uh, then uh, another problem, uh, or of course, uh, when we are talking about construction of the new elites, creation of the new elites, we are going to the point of privatization. And from my point of view, for example, as a Bulgarian, that uh, uh, in Bulgarian public space there is a lot of talk that privatization was something really. Uh, it was it was done in untransparent manner that a lot of crooks took part in this process that it created unfair transition and unfair new elite. I was quite impressed, for example, that in the German textbooks uh, we have the same problem. Uh, uh, privatization is mentioned. Usually, uh, uh, it is not discussed widely. It is the same in Bulgaria, and there is only one textbook in Germany that is. Uh, talking wider and wider uh, for the problem of privatization and it is saying in several uh, 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 and it's trying to and it's trying to uh, uh, to explain the problem uh, that privatization in eastern Germany was uh, mm, uh, there were also crooks that took part in it and uh, uh, mm, mm, mm. so finally it is it, it is uh, uh, there are quite a, a lot of common points between uh, Bulgaria and, for example, Eastern Germany, although, of course, uh, Eastern Germany always was presented in Bulgaria as a kind of the most positive example, as with the same I can say about Poland or Hungary or countries in general uh, from, uh, from Central Europe. Uh, the other problem that certainly is not mentioned in the, in the textbooks is the problem of the rule of law. And, it's, uh, and the problem of the rule of law is that there are no European, uh, uh, talking about Bulgaria, but again, it is valid for quite a lot of other countries. Uh, uh, the rule of law is not part of the so-called communitaire, so it's not part of the common legislation of the European, uh, of the European Union. So there is no, no strict criteria uh, uh, what exactly rule of law means, and how rule of law is uh, established. But the problem of law, rule of law is very important because it is exactly the justice system or the rule of law in general that is supposed to answer the question whether transition was fair or not. <clears throat> Meaning that people who were, let's say, criminals or who became rich in a, a, a certain unexplained manner, uh, it's the question of justice system to uh, punish, let punish them, or at least to 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 show that they were not they, they were not good guys. Uh, so the problem, uh, exactly this problem. That's why uh, the problem of rule of law is that important. That's why, uh, especially in Bulgaria right now, it is uh, widely dis uh, disputed topic. Uh, it is disputed topic also in the whole region, and uh, that's why it is important uh, that uh, those things are uh, are missing. Mm. And the third point that uh, is also miss missing, the third important blind, blind spot that is missing in the uh, in the textbooks is exactly this technological revolution that I mentioned and the way that public opinion uh, public opinion is formed. What I mean is that 
uh, technology, uh, I mean, all those new way of uh, 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 creating of uh, uh, public opinion, public space. Uh, it also implies a lot of uh, uh, conspiratorial theories, and we can see it everywhere, not only in Eastern Europe, but also in all countries uh, in Europe, but also in America, and especially today with the COVID, it's uh, even more visible than any time before. Uh, and of course, those conspiratorial theories, it is the easiest way to, to teach transition. Uh, Alicia mentioned it, but I will even sharpen it. Uh, 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 for example, the transition started in all, our, in all our countries, it started as peaceful revolution. And this peaceful revolution or velvet revolution, it was the biggest achievement of our societies at that time. Uh, and it was exactly this success that uh, it became a revolution be, be, uh, without being bloody revolution. Uh, it was uh, it was a sort of uh, uh, and uh, it was regarded as 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 a big thing. But from current point of view, with uh, those new way of making the publicity, it's quite easy to present this peaceful revolution as a grand deal, grand deal between old elites and the new elites. And in this way, you can present that all the people that were involved in this. Uh, 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 that were involved in this big transformation, in this peaceful revolution, they were actually bad guys, or as Alicia used the term, a traitor. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why I think uh, uh, when we're talking and when we're teaching transition, we have, to, uh, uh, we have to have in mind this technological revolution and the way that uh, public, opinion, uh, public opinion is formed. Uh, so what's the what's the, the conclusion out of those mapping and what to me is important? Uh, the first and most important thing is that uh, uh, although we have started from a common point, from a common starting point, collapse of communism, uh, uh, narratives divided so completely that we're discussing in our textbooks only the successes or failures of our own countries. And we have lost completely uh, uh, what was going on in the region in general. Uh, so this denationalization of, of, of narrative of transition or deprovincialization, if I can, if, if I can state it, uh, if I can state it like this, I think it's a very important starting point because uh, it implies that uh, uh, still, uh, societies in our region, uh, they have quite, quite a lot of common problems. And those common problems are uh, the experience of other countries, although each country is, of course, unique, all, uh, each country has its own problems, uh, but sharing and having the, the wider context of the other, uh, of the other countries would help, uh, would help uh, uh, explain uh, the developments in our own uh, own societies. Uh, so this wider context, is, I think, it's uh, uh, it's something very important. And the other important point, with uh, also, it, uh, I think, uh, I find uh, it's uh, it's crucial uh, when we are teaching transition, uh, we shouldn't teach it only from the perspective of the state. Uh, uh, transition should be taught also uh, from the perspective of. Of, of the of, of the common people, and uh, uh, when uh, we are uh, teaching or trying to understand the perspective of the common people, we can understand the fact that uh, uh, what, from the point of view of the state, would look like success. Uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, certain groups, it's it can look like uh, it can look like uh, uh, disappointment. Uh, so. Uh, if I can uh, say as a conclusion, uh, to me, exactly this point of, uh, of looking into a wider context, uh, 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 I mean, geographically, uh, but also into a wider context personally, it's is the, the way to, uh, to try to avoid the problems that we're uh, facing in teaching transition uh, right now. Thanks a lot. I hope I was understandable enough, and thanks to the interpreters, of course.
Thank you very much, Mom Chil. It was very interesting. And now we are coming to the uh, presentation of Barbara. So Mom Chil is giving us a direction to where we to where to go. We need to dem uh, to democratize our education. We need to concentrate more strongly on uh, civic activism. And we have a key word as an answer, it's, which is multi-perspectivity. And now Barbara Christoph will tell us what multi-perspectivity multi is and how to work with it. Barbara, uh, it's nice to see you, Barbara. So sorry again. I will talk now under the title Multi-Perspectivity and Historical Thinking. Why do we want to work with eyewitnesses? And let me start with briefly explaining what are my aims for today's talks. Um, can, can you move on to the first slide? Um, I actually want to establish, first of all, a connection between the three terms mentioned in the title of my talk namely between the terms historical thinking, multi-perspectivity, and eyewitnesses by making a twofold argument. First, as soon as you practice historical thinking, you cannot but realize that the past can be and even has to be seen from multiple perspectives, that is from a variety of viewpoints. Second, working with eyewitnesses, that is practicing oral history, uh, can be a wonderful tool for realizing multi-perspectivity, but only under one crucial and often overlooked conditions. We must do nothing less than say goodbye to the idea that eyewitnesses are able to share with us the one and only truth that might be, have been distorted by official history. That, that is an approach you often meet when people work with eyewitnesses in the classroom. And I will try to explain why we really have to say goodbye to that idea. As long as we cling to this notion that eyewitnesses are able to reveal the truth to us, we cannot realize the true potential that lies in oral history and the narratives of eyewitnesses. In fact, Oral, hit, oral history is such a valuable resource because it gives us access to a variety of possible perspectives on the past. Can you move to the next slide, please? To give you a deeper understanding of, of these two arguments, but also to show you what all this means for your daily work with eyewitnesses in the classroom, I will work with you in two different forms today. I will start with giving you a lecture of about 30 minutes, in the course of which I will explain what historical thinking is, how multi-perspectivity enters the picture, and how we can work with oral history in the classroom. I apologize for talking so much, but I would like us to be on the same page with regard to some theoretical ideas. At the same time, I will constantly try to be in, as instructive as possible. I will also translate theoret theoretical ideas into concrete guidelines for classroom practice. And when I provide examples, I will always refer to issues closely related to our shared topic that is to transition. So that's the first part of, of, of my, my lecture, so to say. Uh, the second part, um, in, in the second part, I will invite you to apply what we have discussed so far while making sense of an excerpt from an oral history interview. Specifically, we will look at a passage from a biographical interview with a Lithuanian history teacher that a colleague of mine conducted in 2009 as part of a research project in the course of which we examined how people remember the Soviet Union as well as the period of transition. Um, if we really want to understand what historical thinking is and why historical thinking cannot do without multi-perspectivity, we cannot avoid dealing with a couple of epistemological basics. Okay, can you move on to the next slide, please? Everything begins with, two, with the two insights that history is a somewhat peculiar 
discipline and that history in the sense of stories about the past and history in the sense of the past itself are two fundamentally diff different things. Next slide, please. Um, the, the stories we tell about the past emerge in shifting presence and they cannot but be shaped by the interests by the pressing questions and by the discourses of these presents. The past, on the other hand, the reference of these stories, if you like, is by definition gone. It thus cannot be invoked in order to check for the plausibility of stories told about it, told about the past. This is exactly what distinguishes history as a science, for example, from biology as a science. Biologists can always check the truthfulness of their statements by examining the ob objects their statements deal with. By definition, history does not have these possibilities. You cannot invoke what is gone, as I said. As a consequence, the stories historians tell about the past can never claim to represent the one and only truth. This insight is absolutely central. However, since the word history has two meanings in many languages, I guess in Russian and in German and in English in any case. So since, since this word history is referring to both stories about the past and the past itself, we often tend to forget these insights. At the same time, the realization that the past and history are actually two distinctive things is enormously productive. It directly leads us to the next thesis, according to which stories about the past are always partial, selective, and perspective. Can you please move to the next slide? Why are all histories partial? For the simple reason or for the simple fact that the past reality, like any reality, is so multifaceted, so manifold, that we can never exhaust it in one story. Just to stress that once again, being manifold and being multifaceted is a feature that the past actually shares with the present. In that respect, past and present are actually identical. Perhaps you will understand the idea a bit better with the help of a little thought experiment. Imagine you are given the task of telling someone about your day yesterday. Keep in mind, that you are instructed not to leave out a single detail, not the thoughts you might have while brushing your teeth or the associations that came to you while watching TV in the evening. I am reasonably sure that you would soon capitulate to that task, which would take you endless hours to complete. Furthermore, you will probably realize that we constantly make choices when we speak about our memories, like our memories of, of uh, yesterday, even when we talk about fairly simple and personal things. Most of the time, without even being aware of what we do, we tell apart what is perceived to be relevant enough to be shared with others from what is felt to be so irrelevant that it can be silenced. We do so under the influence of powerful frames or discourses, different uh, theoretical schools would use different terms to describe this. But what is important is that these different frames or different discourses support different selection criteria, which would then tell us what is important and what can be silenced. It is thus frames which have taught us, for example, that the date when we admitted school, or finished our studies or got married and so on are usually really important and need to be mentioned when we talk about. You will soon realize if you compare biographical interviews taken in a lot of different societies and a lot of different times, nevertheless, they will share this, this one uh, fact that most people will mention when they married, when they finished school, when they started to work, something like this. Um, yeah. Um, and at the same time, despite these, these different uh, uh, frames and, and the different selection criteria they support, we may be steered um, by different criteria of relevance depending on the persons we are talking to, on the degree of intimacy 
that uh, characterizes our mutual relationship on the compassion and understanding that we uh, expect from the other or simply on the prior knowledge uh, we ascribe to him or her. Just to illustrate that with the help of a fictitious but perhaps realistic example, recalling her memories of transition and term oil in the early 1990s, a teacher from present day Lithuania may, for example, choose to talk about the cheerful days of national awakening and the many pro-independence demonstra demonstrations she took part in when talking to her students on the occasion of the national holiday of independence. However, when chatting with her best friend, she may select completely different things as being relevant, like soaring inflation rates, the explosion of costs for gas and heating and so on. Historians writing about the past have to take similar decisions on what counts as relevant and what not. Upon closer inspection, the challenges they face are even bigger. They do not only have to make up their own mind, they have to rely on sources, on archived records and files that others have composed under the influence of their own criteria of relevance. Furthermore, the sources they may have access to are as a rule only a tiny share of all the documents that have existed once but are lost now. As a result, the stories historians tell are partial for at least two reasons. First, because the sources they have allow them to see some things while leaving others in the dark. And second, because they, they can only see what they ask for that is what they have marked as being relevant in before. Uh, can you move on to the next slide, please? Explaining why history is partial, I have to some extent already touched upon the issue of why history is selective. I have basically argued that sources, as well as historians, always select those parts of the past they want to shed light on based on their respective criteria of relevancy. Let me illustrate this with another example. As I said, being selective starts with raising questions as it is questions which direct our attention to certain aspects of the manifold reality of the past. During the times I grew up in, that is during the Cold War, the question of which system is better than the other, the capitalist or the socialist system, was clearly perceived to be of higher relevance. But in answering this question, you have to be selective again. You have to decide which criteria you will rely on when assessing the performance of rival social systems. And you have to clarify which among the many socialist and capitalist societies you are going to compare in order to arrive at an answer. In the West German classroom, where I was taught history, both questions were rendered almost invisible. As if it was without alternative, we always compared West and East Germany, and we furthermore usually focused on economic indicators, from labor productivity to the number of cars or refrigerators available per capita. Uh, per capita, sorry. As a result, we could not but conclude that the capitalist West was beyond reach superior to the socialist East. Given the strong evidence we gathered based on these decisions of selection, we were sure that our conclusion was absolutely true. However, we could have easily understood the selectiveness of the history we believed in if we would have confronted it with insights based on other criteria or on other cases of comparison. Thus, we could have compared, for example, Haiti and Cuba. Like the two Germanys, both do have a lot in common. Both are located in the Caribbean, both went through colonialism, slavery, and both had an economy dominated by huge plantations. At the same time, like the two Germanys, again, both took fundamentally different decisions with regard to their social development in the 20th century. While Haiti became capitalist under a strong American influence, Cuba ended up in the Soviet-led socialist camp. 
And if we cast a look at them today, we cannot but realize that socialist Cuba is much better off in many respects than capitalist Haiti. To give you some examples, with 78 years life expectancy in Cuba is much higher than in Haiti, where people on average die with 36. While almost everybody in Cuba can read and write with literacy rates reaching 99%, this applies to only slightly more than 61% in Haiti. Even economic indicators speak a clear language. Per capita income in Cuba is more than six times higher than in Haiti. Unemployment at 3.8% is less than a quarter of Haiti's 16.8%. Just to get to the heart of my story, the two different comparisons we can organize between either West Germany and East Germany or Haiti and Cuba lead us to two different conclusions about the performance potential of capitalism and socialism. And although in both cases, these conclusions are based on solid evidence, both are highly selective, both are reflective of some aspects of past realities why they are grossly misleading of others. Unfortunately, we will often come across historical or political accounts which are based on narrow criteria of selection and narrow ranges of comparison. Can you move on to the next slide, please? At this point, we are also close to understanding why history is always taking a perspective. What is actually meant here are two similar but not identical things. On the one hand, sources, for example, can reveal only those things about past realities to us that were accessible and observable to the author of these particular sources. To give you an example, if you read the diary or the memories of ordinary people about transition, you can expect to learn a lot about the overall atmosphere that dominated in society at that time. However, you cannot really expect to learn something insightful or definite about the deeper reasons, for example, for the collapse of the USSR, simply because these people were not in a position to know details about what was going on behind the scenes. Thus, limits of what people in their capacity as authors of sources, as historians or as eyewitnesses can claim to know, make history perspective. On the other hand, and I've already mentioned this uh, in between the lines several times, everybody who talks or writes about the past does so under the influence of certain discourses. Accordingly, she or he looks at that very past from the perspective of certain values or criteria of relevancy that are supported by these discourses. To prevent you, pre present you once again with some examples, a person deeply influenced by liberal views will probably tell the story of transition as a story about the, the victory of freedom and democracy over repression and authoritarian dictatorships, which are in the long run doomed to fail anyway. Another person who is a critical observer about uh, uh, observer of the many current crises in capitalist societies may frame the same story of transition as a story about the worldwide expansion of neoliberalism and the collapse of all forms of welfare regimes, including but not limited to real existing socialism. However, at times, what is at stake are not only differences in political views or value orientation, but differences in experiences as well. This refers, for example, to Olga and Elina, two friends of mine who, for good reasons, tell rather different personal stories about transition. Olga, born in Russia in 1960, experienced the collapse of state socialism as a story of personal liberation. During the Brezhnev years, she, who had been always very fond of literature and history, decided to study physics nonetheless 
because she clearly knew how absolutely dull and boring it would have been to, to study such an ideologized subject like history during late socialism. No wonder she embraced system change as an opportunity to start doing what she always wanted. She emigrated to Canada, studied sociology, and is lecturing in Toronto these days. Elina, born in 1985 in Kyrgyzstan, made completely different experiences. In the early 1990s, her mother had to give up her job as a researcher at Bishkek University because this poorly paid job did no longer feed her family. She started, like many others, to engage in petty trade, traveling back and forth between Kyrgyzstan, China, and Russia. It was left to her seven-year-old daughter, Elina, to take care of her younger siblings, to cook and to clean for them as well for her father, who, like many others, had become an alcoholic in these rough times. To make things worse, on her occasional visits home, Elina's mother found no other way of dealing with her bad conscience for having left the kids alone than to lash out against her oldest daughter, beating her up on a regular basis. For obvious reasons, Elina has thus rather bleak memories of the 1990s. Let me briefly nail down the argument I wanted to make here. It is not only differences in political views or in social positions, but also differences in experiences that make people remember the past differently. And to relate this insight once more to general debates on the nature of historical knowledge, all these different accounts can be equally based in evidence, and yet they can create fairly opposite pictures, all of which present only one partial and selective aspect of past, past realities from one certain perspective that is against the background of certain experiences or under the influence of certain values or political views, which instruct us to decide what exactly is relevant and what not. Can you move on to the next slide, please? I guess at, at this point, you probably already anticipate my next argument about the importance of multi-perspectivity. If we take seriously the idea that history is always partial, selective, and bound to perspectives, if we furthermore agree that schools in democratic societies should abstain from indoctrinating students, that is, from imposing on them one of the many possible stories as the absolute truth, we will emphasize the need to introduce students to a great variety of different voices. We want to make sure that all positions and views discussed and contested in a society are sooner or later presented in the classroom. Multi-perspectivity is probably the single most consensual principle to which history educators all around the globe will subscribe. Uh, can you show please the next slide? Basically, it is three different educational goals which are regularly connected with that principle. First, multi-perspectivity aims, of course, at rendering history more complex and nuanced. Getting to know how differently contemporaries like the local head of communist party and a dissident perceived and experienced transition in many formerly socialist countries will definitely help students to get a fuller picture of what has happened in the late 80s and early 90s. Second, multi-perspectivity promises to democratize history. Implemented properly, it will assure that the at times opposing views of as many people as possible, and not only the positions of those who are close to those in power, to dominant ideologies or hegemonic discourses are heard in the history class classroom. Third, multi-perspectivity clearly has the potential to introduce to and remind students of the epistemological principles I have just discussed. Being exposed to the diverse and at times even outrightly opposing stories told about transition by people with either different political beliefs or diverging life trajectories constantly reminds students of the fact that all we have from the past 
are the selective, partial, and perspective taking accounts. Please move on to the next slide. To some extent, these three goals I have just described to the principle of multi perspectivity correspond to the three different modes of practicing it, that is, to three different ways of selecting the variety of viewpoints on the past you would like to bring to a hearing in the democratic history classroom. To start with, you can focus on presenting multiple perspectives on one and the same historical event as articulated by the contemporaries of that very event in the very same time this event had actually taken place. Would thus definitely or specifically look out for different sources and maybe even for different types of sources produced in the past. Just to say that loud and clear once again, at the moment we are talking about accounts that are reflected in sources and that were thus set up in the past itself. We are not talking about accounts that may have been given also by eyewitnesses, for example, in oral history interviews, but only much later. Just to give you an idea of what kind of sources I'm talking here, if you deal with transition, you can, for example, compare excerpts from the protocol of an emergency meeting convened by the Communist Party in response to mass protests with a diary entry of a person who actually participated in these protests. In all likelihood, the different perspectives will not only be shaped by diverging political views, but also by different degrees of insider knowledge. A second way of practicing multi-perspectivity would do the opposite. It would not focus on different voices raised in the past, but on comments that had emerged in the aftermath of the historical events in question, preferably at many different points in time, somewhere in between the historical past we are talking about and our present. Just in order to point out what the benefit of such an approach would be, I guess we all remember that the comments written on transition in the very beginning of the 1990s were generally speaking much more enthusiastic than the much more pessimistic judgment we hear nowadays. 30 years ago, many observers were still pretty much convinced that the so-called third wave of democracy had been a moment of liberation capable of bringing freedom and prosperity to all and everyone. After the financial crisis of 2008, and after the electoral successes populist parties have claimed all over the world, and after talks about the end of the West have gained more and more prominence in recent years, cynicism and disappointment have come to replace the initial hopes. Looking at the different stories told in different moments of time, looking, for example, at the accounts given in different uh, generations of history textbooks would be one way of enabling students to understand pretty well the enormous influence shifting presence with their respective hor horizons of expectations have on the stories we tell about the past. Obviously, the same could be achieved by comparing oral history accounts that have emerged in different times. Research has thus, for example, shown that it was only in the, late, in the late 2000s that ordinary people in Estonia would dare to share their memories of the happiness and joy they have experienced in their personal lives during socialism. In the 1990s, in the shadow of powerful public discourses that would recall Soviet times exclusively as times of suffering and mourning, these memories had been effectively silenced. The third and last strategy of realizing multi-perspectivity in our dealings with the past focuses on paying attention to different versions of the past, contesting with, with each other in our very present. In light of increasing societal pluralization with more and more actors and more and more media channels producing interpretations of the past and vying for the attention of many fragmented, fragmented fragmented pu public, sorry, this approach clearly gains in significance. In all likelihood, people getting their information from different sources like Telegram, TikTok videos, or transnationally consumed newspapers like The Guardian will also strongly agree about how to make sense of our past. 
Under such conditions, it is not only the somewhat democratic duty of schools to include as many of these controversial perspectives as possible in the debates in the history classroom, it is also really important to do so if schools want to contribute to the, to the integration of our increasingly divided and polarized society, not by preaching something like a minimal consensus, but by enabling students at least to understand the different positions of different people as an expression of different experiences and values. At this point, at latest, I think it should be immediately obvious that working with eyewitnesses with oral history interviews can be enormously productive, especially when dealing with such controversial historical events as transition. Just a quick just to quickly remind you, it is mainly three benefits that students can get from working with the accounts of eyewitnesses. Can you move on to the next slide, please? First, they can provide us with many different types of information. They tell us as much about the past the eyewitnesses is talking about as about the present in which the talking is taking place. We get to know how he or she saw the world back then and nowadays. We are offered insights into the inner and into the outer world of contemporaries. We learn about thoughts and feelings, but also about the possibilities for action they saw or the constraints they felt. We understand the rules and routines that govern, governed life at, at that time, and we comprehend what was perceived to be so normal and we would grasp what were the hopes, desires, and fears that moved people. Secondly, and this may be of utmost importance for teaching transition, biographical accounts render visible how the history of the everyday and the history of exercising power interact with one another. To illustrate that with an example, interviews may reveal to us how much conformism people according to their own perception had to display in autocratic societies, but they may also display how much stubbornness some of them felt able to show. Third, engaging with life stories, we do not only have the chance to learn about the past experiences pe different people made, we also get to know how differently they reflect about these experiences in their memories. Can you move on to the next slide, please? However, despite the richness of learning chances oral history interviews offer, working with them in the classroom may also present us with some rough challenges. Research has thus, for example, shown that students are sometimes simply overwhelmed by the authenticity they ascribe to the story of eyewitnesses. Especially under the spell charismatic speakers are able to cast, they can simply be seduced to forgetting everything they have learned about the partiality and selectivity of history. They may, take, they may tend to take everything they hear as the only and all encompassing truth. Teachers who use emotionally moving stories about a certain event in an illustrative manner to make a certain point may furthermore increase the confusion which is thus created. Having pointed to the risks we may run into when doing oral history in the classroom, let me close this lecture by reflecting on some of the strategies we may refer to in order to overcome or at least to manage these risks. Please move on to the next slide. I will start with some general remarks. When dealing with the accounts of eyewitnesses, students definitely need the help of teachers and of carefully designed tasks in order to better understand that also these eyewitnesses cannot but provide subjective, selective, and partial perspective on events past. Furthermore, in no case should they be given just short excerpts from a life story. It is really of, of, uh, of very great significance for the success of the whole thing that they are provided with a whole life story of a person. Only then do they have a chance to reconstruct the selection choices an interviewee has made and to discover the traces the situation in the present has left on the stories they tell about the past. 
To illustrate that again with an example on transition, students would definitely gain from knowing how the life of the eyewitnesses whose accounts they are dealing with has developed after transition. Only then would they be able to understand why the story of a former communist party boss, for example, who managed to make a career in post-communist times would differ from the story of another party boss who lost all his power, wealth, and status after the regime change. To get a little bit more specific, when working with eyewitnesses in the classroom, I would strongly recommend to draw on the four principles Sam Weinberg, one of the masterminds behind the concept of historical thinking, has developed for critical work with sources. He has actually suggested a four-step program. Please move on to the next slide. The first step is sourcing. Students should always be taught to pay due attention to who has written a certain source with which intentions and motives. What does this mean for working with eyewitnesses of transition? It means, for example, to be alert to the fact that the interviewees in all likelihood want to present themselves as morally acceptable persons in the categories of contemporary discourses. In a country like Ukraine, for example, former party members will perhaps emphasize particularly often how dear the Ukrainian nation or the Ukrainian language has always been to them. The second step is then contextualization. Students should be instructed to seek information on the concrete circumstances in which a source has emerged. They may, for example, reflect on the influence present day political constellations have on the selection choices interviewees make during the interview and in their account. To give an example, all Lithuanian teachers we have interviewed in 2009 would talk sooner or later about the three single most important issues that dominated public discourses at that time, the anti-Soviet partisans, the Catholic Church, and the KGB. The third step would then be close reading. Students should focus not only on other claims and argument, but also on minor linguistic detail, which may tell us a lot about the position the author of a source is taking. Generally speaking, it is always reward, rewarding to focus on small words like but or however, because they show us what a person constructs as being either surprising or in need of a detailed explanation. You can also always raise the question whether respondents present themselves as either active or passive agents, or you look at the label a person uses. One older Lithuanian history teacher we interviewed would thus, for example, label her own father, who had obviously been deported to Siberia during Soviet times, alternatively as a bandit and as a partisan. Already this choice of words shows how she is constantly shifting between the old Soviet discourses she grew up with, which would describe her father as a morally corrupt bandit, and the post-Soviet discourses of her present which would honor the same father as a heroic freedom fighter and partisan. The fourth and final step is corroborating by comparing different sources. You can either, either organize a comparison between different interviews or between different parts of one and the same interviews. At times it is really interesting to compare what people say when they narrate a concrete event with what they say when they make a general argument. Taken together, all these four steps should help students to develop a deeper understanding of the stories they listen to, to, to reflect on them as the product of specific constellations and to escape simplistic black and white accounts. In the very end, they might be able to achieve a goal worth to be achieved namely to tolerate different versions, different versions of the same past without losing the ability to come up with their own hopefully reflective position. And here I, I would like to, to stop uh, for a moment with a lecture um, and give you the opportunity maybe to raise questions to disagree on, on some things I have said, because in the next step, we will then look, look at the interview. I know time is short, but I would nevertheless like to give the opportunity
to ask one or the other question. Uh, Barbara, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that there are two questions in the chat. Oh. Okay. Okay, the, the first question is on, on how uh, multi, multi perspectivity relates to uh, controversy. Actually, there's a, a lot of debate on terms in, in the scientific literature. Um, some people like I would say there are different ways of realizing multi-perspectivity. Yeah? Like I said, these three different strategies, you can focus on different versions or different perspectives produced in the past, in between the past and the present or in the present. Other people would say um, multi-perspectivity refers only to the first strategy, yeah? like different perspectives from the past itself. And they would use the word, the word controversivity God, do you say that in English, controversiveness, um, in order to talk about different perspectives on the past as produced in the present? Yeah, so th that would be the difference. That this, uh, like, like always, uh, terms are used in different words, and you can make these uh, differences, or you can 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 um, use the word or the term multi perspectivity in a broader way uh, to encompass all these different uh, versions. Yeah, I see only one question, Nora. Ah, yeah, so uh, the, the second part of the question, I would then definitely answer in a positive way. Uh, controversiveness, controversy is for me um, an element of multi-perspectivity. And once again, I, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that some authors would say multi-perspectivity multi and controversy, two different things. Yeah. Okay, I do not see any more questions. If that is not the case, I would like to use the rest of the time to cast at least a very quick glance at the interview, at the excerpt from the interview. Uh, Barbara, um, Dumbbell, you sure? I, I didn't approach. Barbara, there was another question by Nadia. At the very beginning, they asked, Nadia asked, when you compared uh, Cuba with other countries, why you wouldn't do that with another country which has a dictatorship, which is in a dictatorship? Cuba and Belarus or whatever. I mean, it's your decision. And the, uh, the, the the cases you select for comparison have an enormous influence on the result of that comparison. And of course, you always have to engage in justification. Why do I compare East and West Germany? Why do I compare uh, Haiti and Cuba? Or why do I compare Ukraine and Belarus, for example? Yeah. Uh, so uh, always you, you, you have to, to justify what you are doing. But nevertheless, uh, the, the cases you select for comparison will have an enormous influence on, on, on the conclusion you arrive at. This is what I wanted to demonstrate. Yeah? Usually in, 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 the, in, in the Western world, when we talk about socialism and, and capitalism, we tend to compare East and West Germany because you have that kind of ideal type of situation when two societies would share a lot of history um, took different path in, in the 20th century and, and this, this, so to say, qualifies them for a nice comparison. Yeah, but and, and I, I use this, this comparison be, be, between Cuba and Haiti to show that you can draw into question uh, at least um, the, the universality of, of, of the result you may arrive at when you compare East and West Germany. Yeah? Uh, when you compare different countries, you may see that a socialist country in, in many uh, aspects or in many levels was better off than 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 uh, the capitalist country. Yeah? That's actually what what I wanted to show with this story. Yeah? So um, comparison is never innocent. Yeah, you 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 uh, already take a very very um, uh, you, you already have a very huge influence on, on the result of your comparison by choosing the cases you want to compare. 
Yeah, if, if that, I hope this is an answer to the question. Ah, do we know valid information about Cuba? Hmm. Um, yeah, you can always draw into question the validity or the, uh, uh, the, the, the trustworthiness of sources. Uh, I, I was actually referring to, to statistics from, from the World Bank, which in my eyes is an institution you can more or less trust. And Cuba um, was dependent on loans from the World Bank. So we, we can expect uh, them to, to know a bit about the situation in, in, in the country. But of course, you can always draw into question in how far sources are, are trustworthy or not. And I'm not a specialist on Cuba or Haiti. Um, uh, I, I just looked for, for, for a case to prove that you can get only a partial picture if you compare like we are normally instructed to do East and West Germany. Yeah. Maybe the but but then the longer I think about it, maybe then then the statistics from from Haiti are even less trustworthy because not because um, they would try to hide something, but because Haiti is I guess really close to a failing state and and this to a failing state and the state simply may not have this the statistic, statistic data uh, that they provide. Anything else that I overlooked? Nora, I guess not, right? Okay, then I would really like to use the last minutes we have to cast at least a superficial look at that interview with the Lithuanian history teacher. Actually, normally I would have asked you to read that for themselves, for yourselves, and and then answer to a couple of questions. But but um, as we are running out of time, uh, I will just not do that. I will quickly try to sum up what is interesting about this interview, and I think you, this this would be a wonderful example you could use in in the history classroom, and you could actually do all the things Sam Weinberg uh, is advising you to do. So you can uh, do sourcing, you can, you can corroborate, um, and you can contextualize. But before you do all these uh, nice and wonderful things, you should, of course, make sure that everybody un understood what, what is said in the interview. And as you may see from this excerpt, this is not always as simple as it might appear at first glance. So let, let me just quickly uh, sum up what you read in, in this excerpt from the interview. Um, uh, Biruta, the, 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 the Lithuanian history teacher, she's actually coming up with three different stories on church-state relations during Soviet times in Lithuania. Yeah. In the first story, she's talking about a colleague of her uh, who fall victim to the anti-church anti policies of, of the state during communism because she was fired after uh, she uh, attended a religious, uh, religious ceremony for her wedding. Yeah? So what can we learn from this? And, and Birute is, is uh, drawing our attention to this. It is really true that people were persecuted when they remained loyal to, to their religion and when they attended uh, uh, church ceremonies, for example. Yeah, this is the first story. Then the second story uh, is about uh, Biruta herself. Yeah, she, she is um, telling us that she has been baptizing her children, although she is a teacher, although she might have faced the risk of being fired as her colleague. But she was lucky. Why, she was, why was she lucky? Because the priest in her parish, he would not... Um, register the baptize of her children in the official church register. And why would he not do that? Because he knew that people from the KGB would regularly come and cast a look at this book in order then uh, to cause trouble to people who attended ch the church ceremonies. Yeah, This is the second story. So what can we learn from the second story? Um, it was not impossible to, to remain loyal to your religion. You could even uh, become and, and remain a teacher that is working in the atheist uh, Soviet school and at the same time attend 
uh, church ceremonies, if only you were lucky to deal with people um, who were understanding, who know how uh, about uh, the how who know who know uh, how vulnerable you are to state persecution, and who would then act accordingly. And then we come to the third story, which is, I guess, actually the most interesting one. Yeah, this is about the headmaster of the school in uh, which Adele is uh, Birute is working, and. Um, uh, in, in, in that story, it's, it's about the mother of the headmaster uh, who died. Yeah, And uh, Birute is emphasizing, of course, like almost everybody in that generation in Lithuania, the mother of the headmaster was a strong believer. She uh, attended church services on a regular basis. So the headmaster could not but organ organize um, a church ceremony uh, for her funeral. And he did. He and his two sisters, the, uh, who, who also were teachers, they attended uh, the, the funeral in the church. And what happened then? Uh, the priest started to yell at them. The priest started to blame them. Uh, the, 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 the priest started uh, implicitly to blame them because he said, the poor mother, she uh, gave birth to, to three murderers. And actually, I, I would like you to think uh, for a second about what is going on in that story. Why is the priest talking about the, the poor uh, dead mother as the mother of three murderers? Do you have any ideas what, what he may have had uh, in mind? Anybody an idea? Okay, I'm not seeing an answer, and as I have only two more minutes, I give it myself. So he's he's uh, doing something about which we can read a lot in Lithuanian history textbooks. Yeah, um, Catholic dissidents and and priests themselves they would blame everybody who was working for an atheist state institutions like uh, institution like the school of murdering the souls of, of, of innocent children because they were preaching atheism. So they were teaching um, the, the pupils not to believe in God and in, 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 in the minds of priests and Catholic dissidents that was the same as murdering somebody. Yeah. Um, so I, stopping here, uh, I would like uh, to engage a bit in corroborating, that is in comparing these stories. I guess what, what we can, can say when we compare them, that, uh, that Birute is giving us a very nuanced picture. She is avoiding black and white stories. She's not telling everybody who had been uh, a Catholic uh, in, in Soviet Lithuania would have suffered enormous repression. No, she said that, that there have been cases and we should not forget that there have been these cases. But if you were lucky and if you were a little bit like smart and you had to do with smart people, you can avoid, you could avoid state repression. And she is also um, revealing to us that it's not only the communist state who acted as, as a perpetrator, making, making people suffer and um, uh, 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 repressing uh, people. No, uh, priests from the Catholic Church, they also could have acted as perpetrators. Yeah, I guess you, you would all agree that the story she is sharing with us is really horrible. Just imagine you attend the funeral of your mother. It's a very so uh, a sad and moving moment. And then the priest, ex ex priest ex accuses you of being a murderer. I, yeah, I guess we, we could say in that story, the priest is act acting like a perpetrator. Yeah. Um, so first thing by means of corroborating, I guess we can understand uh, Birute is trying to move beyond black and white pictures. She's trying to show us a nuanced picture of how things really were when you talk about state and church relations during Soviet times. I would have loved to, to do with you the contextualization. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that we do not have time for it. But I guess if we would have done it, we, we could have seen that Adele is actually, inter, uh, Beirut is actually 
intervening with these three stories in a public discourse, which is very much divided, divided between two different positions, both of which paint black and white pictures. Yeah, One of them saying everybody who worked for the state was a perpetrator, an evil person, morally not acceptable, uh, and, and uh, uh, the ones they repressed, they were poor and innocent victims. The, the, the other position arguing, uh, hmm, it's, it's not that clear cut. If, if, you, if we cast a closer look, we can see, for example, that the partisans sacrificed people for a hopeless case. Yeah, they, uh, people who supported them were, were then persecuted by the state. And in the end, it's, it's also the fault of the partisans who, who, um, who, who are actually responsible for people being persecuted for helping them. And furthermore, for example, the Catholic Church was a very conservative uh, element which preve prevented, especially in the interwar period, the modernization of Lithuanian society. And they would then argue the, the people who really did something important for the Lithuanian nation were, were mostly the ones who became members of, of the Communist Party, but not because they believed in communism, but because they wanted to occupy positions of power that uh, uh, enabled them to do something for the Lithuanian nation. Yeah? So these are the very much uh, opposed um, positions present in, in the overall Lithuanian discourse. And I guess we can see that Birute is taking issue with both of these positions. In between the lines, she is arguing, um, do not believe in these black and white pictures, all of them are uh, uh, neglecting important aspects of a much more complex reality. The most important thing uh, probably in, in her argument would be it's not about people being for communism and people being for the nation, like a clear cut binary opposition between national heroes and national perpetrators. No, it, it's a much more a moral question. You had good and bad people on both sides. Yeah. The, 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 the priest who yelled at the, the headmaster during the funeral is um, definitely an example of, of a bad person, although he, he might have, uh, other people may see him as representing uh, the church and thus uh, something good. Yeah? And at the same time, Birutas priest is, uh, uh, is a good person because he understood how difficult it is for her and therefore he did not enter the baptize of her children into the church. So what I want to say here is that what is most interesting in, in this excerpt from the interview is how Birut is actually taking issue with hegemonic positions in Lithuanian discourses. Yeah, so she is constantly positioning with her, uh, positioning herself. And, and the desire to position herself and to take issue with these black and white positions dominant in Lithuanian discourse steers her in selecting the stories she wants to tell. And I guess this is something one might uh, really discuss in the classroom. You could spend probably, I don't know, several hours on, on making sense of this small excerpt. And you, you would then uh, probably also refer to other parts of the interviews which would lend credibility um, to the arguments you make. And having said this, um, I really stop talking and cast a look at the comments. Was možna pričasnik ganenjem na crkov v institutionalnem aktivizmu? I do not really understand. So what would that be the idea that Biruta herself? So this we part in repressing people for attending church services? Oh, uh, I think it means. Uh, Can you give me an answer whether this is what, what you had in mind? Would that be your interpretation? that Birute is talking about that yelling priest in order to justify herself, who was a teacher during Soviet times and maybe took part in atheistic persecution of, of other believers. Is this what you want to say? Yeah. 
It's a positive more. So this is a belated answer to your question. Why the priest called them three murderers? Um, but I would rather recommend to, to refer to what we can really be sure about. Yeah, And I guess we, we cannot be sure about what Birute did in the past and what not, what not. We can only see what she is talking about. Yeah, And she herself is talking about how in, in many other parts of, of the inter interview, she is talking about sh how she is rooted in, 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 in Catholic belief, yeah, how she herself is from a very Catholic family. And I was always thinking when I read her interview that because she is um, so sure in her Catholic identity, she can dare to also criticize uh, proponent of, of, of uh, proponents of the Catholic Church who would, for example, yell at people like her headmaster because she, she is, is, so to say, on the safe side. One cannot blame her for being too pro-Soviet because she is from this Catholic family of peasants who had suffered from repression in, in the 50s and so on. So she is above or beyond doubts, doubts in, in, in that regard. Yeah. Um, once again, what, what I wanted to, to show you is um, that you, uh, when you deal with oral history, history interviews in the classroom, you can do all these four steps recommended by Sam Weinberg. You can do this sourcing. Sourcing is, by the way, something I just did with explaining to you the biographic, biographical background of Birute as the author of the source. We did corroborating by comparing different stories dealing with the same topic, that is state church relations in Soviet Lithuania. We did contextualization by raising the question of how, in, in how far is, is uh, Birute in the selection of her stories influenced by dominant or hegemonic discourses in Lithuania? Um, and I guess what, what, what you can see is that you arrive at a much more interesting way of looking at these interviews. You're not, not so much interested in, is it true or is it not true? Is she hiding something or is she not hiding something? You are more engaged in seeing how she is positioning herself in, in the very much divided and contested discourse taking place in present day Lithuania on how to look at Soviet history. And having said this, I probably will stop talking because I've already talked 10 minutes more than I was expected to. So thank you very much.